Welcome back to the games, ladies and gentlemen. We have two fantastic series coming up for you. We've got OG versus Invictus Gaming to start things off, followed up by Evil Geniuses versus LGD. Both of them are going to be cast by myself, Capitalist, as well as my co-caster, Draskal. Draskal, we're going into this series. OG and IG are actually sitting tied up right now in their group, six and four, and both have some... I, I would say maybe some easy matches ahead and some tough matches ahead of them to round out this this uh, group stage of theirs. This series has got to be particularly important for both of them. Oh, absolutely. I think it's even maybe a bit more important for OG because they have yet to play LFY. Yeah. The team that has not dropped a single game. So if you can go up against Invictus Gaming here, put yourself two wins in the books, you're going to be feeling pretty good. Yeah, you, you could then afford two losses to Ella. Yeah, exactly. That happening, right? That's kind of the thing that you have to go into it thinking is we need to win here because LFY has yet to, to be defeated. And sure, you got to have confidence in your own team, but at the same time, it is just very impressive to, to go this far without dropping a match. So opening up here, Slardar coming out from OG. A little bit of, I guess, a different feel than the other games that you and I have personally been casting. Usually we see like the Night Stalker. Sanking is obviously familiar. I mean, this is even different from OG. I was looking over their drafts, and it's not like they were picking up uh, Slardar in the first one, too. They had uh, more interesting draft variants in their opening picks. Um, sometimes they would be open like uh, a hero like Wyvern, for example, which we have been seeing. While IG have been very much locked into, we pick our four position. Sometimes that's Nyx, sometimes that's Night Stalker, Sand King, or Earth Spirit. It's like one of those four, like guaranteed as their opening one. And then if their second pick, obviously it's going to be paired with something. Here, it's going to be Sand King and Puck versus the Slardar. But OG are going in for a very serious physical damage and minus armor combination with Slardar and Alchemist. It puts, I think, Invictus Gaming on the sort of timer where you see the Alchemist really early on. And this has also been kind of a theme at TI where people open up with a hero that could potentially be a core yep. that ends up not being a core. So I don't want to say that's what's going to happen here with the Alchemist, but it's always something that I think IEG are going to have to keep in mind as we continue to see the draft roll out. But if it is the, if it does, in fact, end up being that core Alchemist role, then you're looking at it and saying, OK, we need to figure out how we're going to either shut this thing down in lane or how we're going to be able to pressure the map enough to stop this Alchemist from, from getting to be that absolute beast that we can see. Now, fortunately, IEG, they, they do have some variants in their draft. Punk mostly being played mid right now, but can run into the off lane role. Uh, would you prefer a different mid laner if it is going to be that mid alchemist um, than the Puck? Uh, I don't think that Puck necessarily struggles in that matchup. I think there are heroes that could be better, like Shadow Fiend comes to mind, Exord and Volker, the heroes that just have so much damage yep. that you can continually deny the alchemist farm. The other route I suppose you can take is Dragon Knight we've been seeing quite a bit of. Yep. And that hero is really strong just because you can just stand in the acid spray. You don't even care. You have the, the damage reduction from the Breathe Fire to oh, kind of geez. stop the Alchemist from getting all that farm. And you also, you push, which is really good against Elk. You want to remove the Tier yeah. 1s as fast as you can, get that the map control going your way. So there, there's definitely some options here that the IG can look back to. I like the fact that IG banned some very specific OG heroes that would have been pretty good with this uh, Minus Armor that they're kind of running right now. Um, first one to my mind, Visage. Like obviously, that's been one of the OG specialties, being able to run um, that support visage. We even see a couple of core visages in this group stage as well. Maybe not from OG, but from some other teams. And that obviously would have gone great with the Slardar as well as the uh, taking advantage of the Minus Armor from the Acid Spray. And then the Brewmaster, the, the S4 Brewmaster that has been kind of disruptive in team fights though i i've actually been surprised i was watching one game from s4 brewmaster and it was uh he was suffering quite a bit um sometimes even on the micro element which is a bit surprising to me since s4 is supposed to be renowned um as a uh, a great team fight player but we're gonna go into our second picking phase invictus gaming probably want to pick up their support by now right and just pick up their five position i think you've got enough information that uh, could warrant. How do you de deal with Alchemist, though? Hey, like, if you're planning on this being the 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 core to OG's entire strategy, right? If it's all going to baby pace around an Alchemist, what do you do to beat an Alchemist? Do you take the pushing strategy, which we've seen has been historically run against Alchemist, or have we seen the most recent iterations of Alchemist? I'm talking about maybe like the DAC sort of area, where teams actually just outgreeded 
the alchemist and said, well, if you want to farm, we're also going to sit back and farm a bunch. They're both valid choices, in my opinion. It just depends. I mean, this is a, a great option. It kind of forces the fight. You throw the mm -hmm. rupture on the alchemist, he kind of needs to, to take that engagement unless he has a team to back him up and he can potentially just get out. But the, the thing that I often see is either you hard lane counter him, stuff like, you know, melee heroes Ursa. It's not something that we see a ton of, but it's an option. Again, the, the Shadow Fiend and the DK is definitely great just in the lane itself, and also they both are, are great tower hitters. But I think that the thing about Alchemist is that you hit your peak so fast that eventually if the game even goes post 35 minutes, you start to already feel the effects of your hero's net worth just not really accomplishing as much as you want it to. Yeah. So I think that outgreeting it is maybe the safest choice out of everything. And this is... They're setting up this Alchemist for so much success by banning out the Ancient Apparition. Terrorblade is a great ban because obviously the hero pushes towers very fast. Early in the game, you hit seven, you get your first and second Metamorphosis, you get some tier ones. Mm -hmm. And plus, Reflection is amazing yeah. in team fights against Alchemist, especially if he goes that Radiance route. So I'm liking the way that OG are setting this, this hero up. But at the same time, IG, they have good initiation, good team fight. Bloodseeker is phenomenal against kind of like these not necessarily a single core lineup, but one core who's really, really important to keep down. Yeah. Would you say, Dreskel, um, that the lineups here at the TI group stage have been greedier than the, the meta that has previously been set up in other tournaments? Uh, I think it has a tendency to get that way, because like we were just talking about, playing it greedy can typically be safer because you're not putting your you're not like extending to go for kills you don't feel pressured to go for these smoke plays and right and do stuff that you wouldn't normally want to do so i think what happens is a lot of these teams go oh well if we just have the better late game we can play slow we can play this methodical style of dota where eventually we're going to get to our peak and there's never going to be turning back we're just going to be able to win the game yeah and, it, and then it kind of snowballs a little bit right like one team tries to draft like a little bit greedier yeah and yeah, then, yeah. then another team's like well I'm, I'm also like they're going a little bit greedier that gives me room to also be a bit greedier and then it just kind of like expands expands there have been a few teams that have kind of resisted uh, the greedier lineups that have happened in group stage, I would say point to Evil Geniuses, who I think have been trying to play pretty fast for this group stage, whether or not it's been successful for them. Uh, sometimes they stumbled on their aggression, but they've at least tried to make themselves a lot faster of a, a team. And I would say IG is is another team that I would point to that has kind of resisted the, uh, the greed and has tried to play uh, a pretty fast lineup. And this is definitely looking like it with the Bloodseeker Puck. These are not really farming heroes at all. Those are definitely fighting cores for sure. And they're going to have a whole lot to fight into here. OG, they're doing everything they can to support this Alchemist. You've got a Slardar, Oracle, and Batrider. They're kind of all in on their one and two positions, outputting all the damage. They have a lot to threaten the lanes too. Just between Batrider and Slardar alone, once the heroes both have Blink, it, it's really difficult for, you know, Sand King and Puck and stuff like that to really kind of dodge those ganks just because it's almost instantaneous initiation and then you end up just falling due to Slardar having the, the corrosive haze, a lot of minus armor on top of that. Right. And you can die very, very quickly. So, again, it's it's like you mentioned, they're just trying to give Alchemist, like, one of the best possible games that he can get. And not to mention just the Oracle's flat-out synergy with Alchemist against a lineup that up until the Bloodseeker pick is predominantly magic damage. Mm -hmm. Like Fate's Edict is gonna crush this game. You are immune to everything that Puck does, everything that Sand King does. Keeper of the Light can still mana leak, obviously, but you're not gonna be taking damage and you're doubling the regeneration potential of your ultimate. Yeah, you could even disable the, the Bloodseeker when he comes yeah. in, like if he's all built up and, and he's ready to rock, then you just disable him on whatever hero he's trying to go for and um, that will provide a little bit of protection there. Necrophos is going to be last pick up from OG. We've been seeing a lot more Necrophoses. And that, I, I feel like that's really good versus Bloodseeker because of the, the, the Reaper Scythe element of just being able to hold this hero for a second. And if you can lay down any burst damage, the one thing that I'm kind of concerned about is that OG don't really have that. You know, from, from their supports, there isn't like a dramatic amount of, of burst damage. Crush. Um, you've got the Oracle's nuke, especially your offlaner is very slow damage over oh. time. Ooh, that's greedy. That but, is, that is. But it, it, see, this is the way I see it. The Necrophos pick for OG, they look at the lanes and they say, okay, if we want Anna to have a really good game, we need some kind of self-sufficient hero that can kind of just sit in his lane, 
get creeps, not really be pressured by, you know, even a dual lane, I think it's still kind of hard to pressure Necrophos, depending on what heroes you're putting against him. Yep. And then eventually, if they want to just play it slow, he can even go for teamfight items if he wants. It's also good synergy with the Oracle. So they have two heroes that benefit amazingly well from having False Promise, because you can double the regeneration effect of, you know, you just imagine hitting Ghost Shroud and having a kill with False Promise on how much you're going to heal. <laughs> During that, like I don't Nobody's think you killing can, you. <laughs> I don't think you can die. So I think that's the 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 premise behind it is it's obviously good synergy with the Oracle. It's a self sufficient laner. They needed that to make sure that Anna can do what he wants on the map. Yeah. And the other heroes are just there to create space. Whereas IG, they get the Morphling as the last pick. That hero is very very good against what OG have. Not a lot of pure catch once the Lincoln comes out. You're gonna need to commit a lot to be able to take this hero down. And a super late game Morphling is gonna be able to stand up to an Alk no problem. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if you get that replicate of the Morphling and then you're getting a lot of farm during that period of time. This is... I, I like IG's lineup a lot. It looked a little clunky in, in that, like, Bloodseeker, Keeper of the Light area. I felt like, okay, I could kind of see some synergy. Blinding Light with Rupture and uh, Mana Leak. Okay, that's kind of a cool concept and stuff, but I wasn't sure if they were really going to overwhelmingly take team fights against OG. But with this Morphling now, now we don't necessarily have to. Right? We don't have to end this game by 25 minutes. We don't have to just overwhelm OG and make sure that we win all these team fights and take these objectives because Morphling gives us ideally the better late game. They have the heroes to be able to show in like three different lanes at the same time. Yeah. That's the scary part, I think. Once it gets to the mid game, you're going to have a Morphling one lane, Puck another lane, Sand King or Coddle in another lane. And sure, you have pick for sure. But can you kill them all? Can you get Ana to that critical mass fast enough? Can you get that 30 minute six slot that you're looking for and just go down mid and make it so that IG is, is forced to react. That's that's gonna be the true question. I wanna point to that man right there, No Tail. Uh, I feel like he has been sort of linchpin for every single one of OG strategies oh, yeah, 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 of late. I think that, um, that if you looked at OG, especially this last year, like the, every single their, one of their strategies usually felt like it put pressure on the enemy just by existing. That's why oftentimes you saw these, like, the, the Alchemist lineups that they were always running, the Naga Sirens. If, if they picked up this hero that solely by being in the game put pressure on the enemy team, kind of saying, hey, tick tock, tick tock, later this game's going, we're going to get to this hero to its peak, and you have to run into us. And No Tail would always be that, that or usually would be, that safe lane, very active core that would draw a lot of attention away from from the enemy away from that one hero that's kind of farming up which is usually Anna's and and sometimes that would be like uh, I think Terrorblade you know great example they ran a lot of safe lane Terrorblade where No Tail would take that hero and be more active than anybody else that we've ever seen with that hero he would go he would push try and push the off lane tower as quick as he could if he couldn't do that against whatever off lane hero he was facing he would rotate pretty early and he would go into the enemy safe lane and take that tower away. He would just draw attention away from the mid lane, allow Anna to be able to find the farm, to be able to come that mid to late game carry that they, they really need. And, and it seems like this is still kind of the same premise in their strategies, um, just different heroes, right? So now we're seeing Necrophoses. We saw that one Pugna game, even if that didn't go great for no It wasn't great. Right, it, it was still the same idea, right? It's a hero that draws a lot of attention from the enemy just due to its nature. And I think Necrophos is, is particularly good at that, right? Because he's self-sufficient in lane, he gets a lot of farm, and you know he's gonna ball out of control unless you address him. And he's gonna be, you know, getting aggressive and he's gonna be in these team fights and stuff. So you're naturally gonna try and focus him and that will ideally open a lot of space for Anna's Alchemist to uh, get the full 20K Alchemist that's unstoppable before anyone hits 10K. That's the, the genuine hope, right? But I think a lot of emphasis is going to be put on this mid lane. Bloodseeker in a game where you have the heroes of capability of harassment, right? Like mm -hmm. that, That's the big thing. How much benefit can you get out of this thirst in the mid lane? Because Bloodseeker is notorious for being able to win pretty much all matchups. If you have your side lanes going well, you're going to win your lane. And you're not going to be able to get harassed out. You start with the poor man shield, as OP already has here. And he's going to be able to pretty much walk down that lane get free farm, he gets the the start that he wants. There is potential for IG to even apply pressure to this line the OG in the early stages of the game. So as you said, and very aptly so, it's about how much room can they create for not just Ana, but even the other heroes like JRX and S4, they both want blinks. Yeah. Like these heroes in conjunction, they, they do need quite a bit of farm. 
but I think that's why it necessitated picking up a hero like Necrophos, that hero who could just be the one who exists in the lane and doesn't need support help, and Jerax and, uh, Jerax and um, Fly can do pretty much whatever they want. You know, I'm kind of concerned that OG don't have enough wave clear. I think IG, like, they have overwhelming amount. They've got Puck, instant kill creep waves. They've got Sand King. Later on, he also does that. Morphling's obviously going to be doing some, you know, standard slow pushing Morphling things. Uh, and then you've got Keeper of the Light as well, who can instant kill creep waves. So you've got three kind of supporting heroes that all are able to farm really quickly through lanes. And then a Morphling who just does split pushing things. I'm concerned that their lanes are going to be pushed in so much, they're not going to be able to do a lot of this lane maintenance because Oracle, Slardar, and Batrider really don't excel at that sort of things. And that, that will definitely close off the map quite a bit in its own right uh, for OG. I, yeah, that, that's the one thing, too, that we talked about the whole 30-minute Alchemist wants to win the game, more yep. or less. There's, I guess, a couple of Aghanims he can give out. Like, Batrider and Necro are probably the two best that come to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that Oracle has one, too. You don't really see it so much. Yeah, but that's um, great. I think the Necrophos one is probably priority number one. But after that point, you're kind of... You're looking at a team that's more or less hit its peak, I feel. And then if the game keeps stretching out past that point, IG are going to go right back into the driver's seat with the, the Morphling and the, the Ultra Late. Sure, you're always going to have your Necrophos Reaper Scythe to fall back on. But I think that this game is going to be... Like, the drafts, for me, are both very even. They just have different points in the game and, and when they're the strongest. And I think that IG might have a little bit more time in the game where their lineup feels better than what OG have. But OG's window is super strong. Yeah. Like, if they can get it, it's very hard to stop. What do you think, uh, going back to the Reaper's site, we had this Morphling picked up last pick. Great against Alchemist. One of the best carries to counterpick an Alchemist. But what about this Morphling versus the Necrophos. What about the fact that he makes himself, you know, supposed to be so tanky, but we've got this sort of percentage-based damage coming out from Reaper's Scythe. Is that a concern for IG? I think it has to be, given how many ways they have to break Lincolns, especially. Like, eventually, Blink Batrider, you have Slardar. Oracle is actually very good at breaking Lincolns as well. Purifying Flames has great range. So if, if you're not paying attention, you can certainly get caught off guard, no question. It's just a matter of, you know, how the fights go, how good Burning's farm is comparatively to the, the other cores on OG. And, I mean, there, there's a lot of, I guess, uh, a lot of thinking you can do about it. But really what, what matters the most is how are the lanes going to go, how much pressure do OG want to apply, how long does it take them to get their blinks. Yeah. Because those things are all extremely important to OG hitting their timing. Because it's, as much as it is about Ana getting the farm, it's also about the heroes getting items necessary to create that space. Right. I think one of the things that, like, IG, in these team fights, Morphling should never be the one hit by a Reaper's Scythe, right? Because they've got so many, in they've got initiation from both Puck and the Sand King, and then they've got the Bloodseeker on the front lines. Morphling is going to be kind of like the last one heading into right. a team fight, right? So oftentimes, I think that Reaper's Scythe just uh, won't be held on to long enough to be able to threaten the Morphling. In team fights, anyway. We'll see uh, OG Jarex is going to poke his head out into the IG side. See if uh, he can uh, possibly contest that body room, but uh, doesn't look like it. Bobica. So, four position with boots first. He's going to do that play where he tries to catch the mid laner after he picks up the bounty room, but there's no mid laner actually there. It's just S4, so Bobica's just going to book it straight towards the bounty room and take it away. So, OG. We'll actually only get one bounty at this whole entire thing, but it's the Alchemist bounty rune, so that kind of makes up for it. That's, yeah, it's definitely value. I yeah. think you can you can justify. <laughs> They're up in net worth. That's a win, you right? You can justify missing your block for that, I think. Yeah. Especially if Jerax wants to start by being a little bit annoying in the mid lane. Looks like he's just scouting things out for the time being. Yeah. How do these uh, supports play? with the mid lane. Do you think there's more emphasis on OG to have their four positions hit against the Bloodseeker? Because it is a problem, right? OP just gets free harassment on Ana all day long because he knows he can always heal up afterwards. Yeah, this rage. this 1v1 is definitely not Alk favored. You look at uh, other heroes like Ursa, for example, who are really good melees against Alk. Bloodseeker is, is up there on that list as well. Yeah. So I think it's tough, though, because if Jerax walks over there, what is he really going to accomplish as well? Like, how much harassment can he really do with just boots first? I think that this is probably the, the biggest issue that OG are going to run into, is how do they deal with Bloodseeker? They managed to get a stun here in top lane. S4 is going to hit the blast. Morphling's still ready to go. He actually has his nuke picked up rather than the waveform. And... Uh, 
will manage to get a bit more onto S4. But this is all good, right? Even if they don't hit him, which he is going to be able to dodge that one. They've gotten him low enough that the Bloodseeker, he just charges forward at Jarek he's got all the extra movement speed and damage. This is the, one of the best things. Sometimes not killing a hero is actually so much favorable for the Bloodseeker lineup, just because Bloodseeker gets a huge laning phase advantage at that point. Not just that, but there's no shrines until five minutes. So yeah. S4 is going to be sitting up here waiting to slowly tango his way back into being able to lane. And you can see middle OP is just like aggressively posturing here against both heroes. Dual lane me? Think I care? For what? For what? He just runs at him. So Jarex is going to hope for the two minute rune. It was actually reach and down at bottom. Uh, now that Jarex is away, XXS can feel a little bit more comfortable as the puck. Here at bottom, uh, it's not a particularly dangerous matchup that he's dealing with. Necrophos and uh, Oracle, there really is no kill potential. So our puck should do all right. Uh, oh, he still he got it? That whole time, Jerax was like running at him, and he still ends up getting credit for the first blood. But Damn. Sending the courier back in, knowing that the Sand King was there. It's very strange. So OG to pick up the first blood, but comes at a very hefty cost, especially since Anna. Oh no, ult. don't tell me, OP's just gonna run at him. Oh God, Anna does a little loop-de-loop -loop around the tower and OP will give up on that chase. He doesn't want to drop too low. Because the worst thing he could possibly do is Bloodseeker is be a little bit low, Blood Rage, and try and go for a CS and all of a sudden die to a gank. So he just needs some CS. Heal back up in the full. That's why Jerex is here on the front lines, trying to make sure that OP doesn't get any of that heal off. Now, this is one of the most effective ways to deal with the Bloodseeker once he starts losing HP. But you can see OP, he just does a huge amount of damage. It's very hard to, like, deny him unless you can threaten to kill. That's uh, something that Alchemist certainly suffers at. Not a whole lot of uh, kill setup for your supports. They're they, they just come in and stun and you have acid spray in that. Yeah, they're, they're doing a good job, though, of making sure, like, Anna knew that his lane was going to be rough, so, like, he immediately rushed Iron Town, and earlier on, Jerax pulled enemy creeps into the jungle, so Anna could continue to kill that wave and the, the jungle creeps simultaneously. So he's, he's still getting a, a good chunk of CS, even though a lot of it is neutrals, and I think that's what's important, like, staying relevant. And during the time he's sitting in the jungle and going back to base and whatnot, Jerax is still able to soak some VXP of his own in mid. S4 is pretty happy with himself. Uh, they've been trying to pull quite a bit, and he's been contesting that pull and is actually sitting at level 4. Good amount of CS, too. 17 and 0, considering some of that is uh, some big neutral creeps. Pretty good for our offlane Batrider. In comparison to XXS's Puck, which Jarver talked about how there's, this is not a lane that he's going to have a lot of kill potential uh, directed towards him, just uh, harassing him really for the next. I'm surprised he's having such a hard time staying in EXP range. Like, S4 is almost a full level ahead of him. I guess, you know, S4 always has the jungle potential and he can kill the camps, but I figure that XXS would be able to stay a little bit closer to the, the waves. No Tail has gotten a few denies in there as well. Helps, but Jesus. Uh, look at our Bloodseekers tonight. Oh yeah, this is classic Bloodseeker. XXS. Tries to contest a little bit of the pull there. He's managed to get away. Silence onto No Tail, but No Tail's level 5 with the level 3 death pulse. He regens and heals up very quickly. You see us. Same exact thing as a Bloodseeker, right? Like, you can you can kind of harass him and stuff, but it doesn't matter as if, if he gets uh, any real CS. So you've got to have a lot of uh, middle lane. Kill potential. Fly. He is definitely dead. He goes for the long ensnare onto OP, but. Within melee range, it doesn't really matter. So OP using his first rupture, gonna kill on mid lane and threaten that mid tier one tower. That's a, one of the things that I think Bloodseeker is criminally underrated for, is that he not just wins his lane, but he does so much physical damage, he's actually great at hitting towers too. In the early game, if you have this much of an advantage, yeah, you can just walk up there. Both of the supports of OG were kind of forced mid, and sure, you, you end up losing the, the Oracle to a rupture, but the more important thing again is just what Anna can do in the meantime. He's going for the armlet now. He's got the soul ring, almost six. And then, the, you know, S4 is still getting a, a fair chunk of EXP as well. So they, they have two heroes doing well. And then you look at the side of IG and the Bloodseeker is, is crushing it. He's, he's doing very well in his lane. And then Burning is getting his own three farm. So both teams getting what I think they need out of this early game. Yeah, it's definitely IG not running away with a serious net worth lead just yet. Uh, burning. 
also is uh, doing well enough in his lane that he's beginning to pressure the offlane tower. So we already kind of talked about how wave clear he's going to be able to present a lot of opportunities for IG to control the map, but these early tower losses could be a real hurtful. Bottom lane, they're going to try and go for no-tail here. XXS jumps away before the Reaper Scythe could go down on him. Bobica's quite low, and he will manage to get the Reaper Scythe, but it's not enough to finish up Bobica. Bobica's actually turned around. What a man, Bobica! He managed to get the kill on no-tail after surviving through the Reaper Scythe. Oh man, that was so close. I didn't actually know if he was in range to get the Reaper, but committing really hard there, getting punished. It's a little unfortunate getting that, like that particular hero dying. You, you kind of want him to be the stability of your team, you know? Rupture on Ana mid here with the silence and the new coming in. And it's just going to have to TP away. He actually TPs up to what, top? Uh-oh. That's not a great place to be because there's no shrine. And he uh, actually still has uh, vision. OP is... He's loving all this low HP. Miscommunication, maybe? Maybe he thought the shrine was up. Yeah. Or maybe he thought he wasn't going to take so much damage so he can go and jump. He has ulti now. He should be all right. Yeah. As a result, OP is going to run back in the lane real quickly and get some more damage onto that tier one. Bobka trying to threaten fly. Garrix is here. He's able to sprint run him down. Now, Anna does not have unstable concoction. So, again, no real kill potential here. Bobica could have just burrow struck over the cliff and felt truly threatened. Uh, XXS has actually left his lane to come sit behind this mid tower. They really want to take this tier one nice and early before the Alchemist gets big enough to defend it by himself. They also have the coil at the ready, so you're not going to be able to TP out from another rupture this time. They're going to be able to jump onto the Alchemist here with a Morphling and Bulbica. Jarex is here to be able to get the stun, fakes it out, and manages to get it after the waveform. Anna's sitting him inside the trees, but he will be ruptured up. The silence is going to go down as well, and Anna will end up dying to that one. OP with all the extra movement speed is going to try and go for Jarex here. Stun goes down. Fly. He is actually going to be He's the one so in some fast. trouble. He actually has Fortune Sent on cooldown. It doesn't oh. have the disarm, so he won't be able to stop OP. Back over to S4, the Batrider. Yeah, OP's just going to go ahead and TP. He's not going to risk getting caught by S4 here. This would be too big of a loss. They are going to be able to take that mid tower because of that, though. Burning will gladly take it as the Morphling. I love the movement across the map of IG. Just recognizing how strong OP is in comparison to what Ana can really offer to his team right now. It's only eight minutes in. You yep. saw a Morphling invading the enemy jungle at eight minutes. And they just recognize, hey, these heroes, they need Blink Daggers, they need farm, they need their ultimates. Like S4 is level seven, but he doesn't have Lasso yet. So they're just able to walk in, punish extremely hard, get a very important tower, and get their aggressive vision down all at the same time. That was one thing that, that OG, when they ran this, uh, this Alchemist lineup, they always put a lot of attention to protecting their mid tower and protecting their off lane tower even because it keeps the off lane jungle super safe for you and also keeps both sets of ancients really available which is what the alchemists get a feed off of uh, later on into the game. But here, Invictus Gaming, because of those rotations you talked about, just funneling into that middle lane and knowing they have the superior power, take that big objective away, and it just unlocks a lot of the areas that Alchemist is going to be farming. Now those areas are going to be a lot more susceptible to rotations from Invictus Gaming. And they're not done yet either. They're, they're making their way. Okay, OP could be in trouble here. Oh, kind of dancing around, but OP is the one who's going to be chased down by the Firefly, Jerex, and S4 will manage to run him down. That's a big, big kill. Especially for S4s. They desperately needed him to, to come online early. I like that early jumps choice. Not that that's uh, anything special. But it really helps to have this bat, bat Rider just be kind of like a tanky Metis that can fight you underneath towers. Now, Bobica is just being the space creator right now. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Bobica, what's, he, what's his plan here? He goes up to the cliff straight to S4, so... Thought maybe he would burrow strike the uh, slaughter and try and go for a TP out. But such luck. They do manage to get a glyph on here on the top lane, preventing the Morphling from taking that tower. They'll get a deny on it instead. Morphling's actually in the bottom lane, spotted out by S4. S4 is going to go ahead and stop that TP. Lasso pulls him back. And, uh, well, with that much sticky napalm, he can get a little bit more damage on the burning, not enough to threaten to kill, but it does force a couple of rotations, so that's actually good enough for S4. He's he's pretty happy with that. OG are in a decent position this time because they, they have heroes in the lane to be able to, to push if they want to. Looks like they're just going to end up leaving No Tail, one of the harder heroes to take down, while IG are, are counter-pressuring the safe lane of OG. Jarex is not leaving Bobica alone. Bobica's trying to be that four position that kind of moves around and stuff, but 
that's the thing. There are bigger, badder four position supports out there than Sankey, right? Oh, There's yeah. Night Stalker, Slardar, I think, is much better, especially now that he's got his level six. It's such a huge level advantage over poor Bobica that uh, he does not stand up well at all in that 1v1. Uh, this is a great hero being able to just be a nuisance. And, and knowing that Sand King is so prevalent in the meta right now, is it, it's a perfect hero to counter him because you can't rely on things like Sandstorm to just get you, you know, you, you don't have a get out of jail free card anymore. Yeah. Look at Jax running all the way behind the tier two just to try and get a corrosive haze down. Meanwhile, S4 thanks them for the stack. They are going to be able to catch Jarex though, as uh, Sprint is silenced going to finish him off, but it costs them two different cores as well as support, all being in that defensive area, and that's perfect for Ana. He feels very confident farming out mid right now, getting closer and closer to his relic. Space created, as they say. That's yeah. exactly what you want if you're OG. I think Fly and Jarex are the, the two heroes on the team right now that probably care the least about dying at this point. I mean, look at the... They had to go into their own jungle and commit two ultimates to kill a Slardar. Like, that... That to me, I'm looking at it and I'm going, all right, cool. My Alchemist almost has his Relic. He's sitting atop the net worth now, 1,500 ahead of OP, when OP was crushing the lane. Now, if you're IG, you just had a lot of space created for that Alchemist. What are you thinking as you're Invictus Gaming? Do you want to just try and take some more objectives, maybe take some early Tier 2s? Where the Alchemist comes online, they're going to go for Fly here, managed to get the silence onto Oracle. Was only level 5 anyway, but OP is in C, and he does have the Amplify damage, plus no Tails here with Reaper Sight. This is a very dead Blood Seeker with some extra Death Timer on the clock. So, IG once again overstepped their bounds. Get caught in the process. This uh, overaggression from them is really costing the early lead they bought themselves in the laning phase. I feel like they're very concerned about not really being able to, to deal with Ana past like the first, you know, five to eight minutes where OP had a clear laning advantage. After that kind of broke down and they invaded the jungle one time and they killed him, past that point they haven't really done much. And killing an alchemist one or two times is great, but you've got to do more. Now. They managed to get a silence coil plus the pull in there. Q brought in Bulbaka for the extra stun, and it was definitely needed. If he had gotten that chemical rage off, ooh, nice blinding light pushback before Jarek's get the stun onto Q. That'll be the end of that. But it is an alchemist who already has his relic, so at this point, Radiance is just inevitable in the next few minutes. Yeah. The, the timing for OG is a little bit different than what IG can do, because IG can take the game a little bit later, and they can say, all right, we got our Morphling to fall back on. Burning's still farming pretty well. He's a little bit below OP's net worth at the moment, but, you know, he's getting what he needs. Yeah. The, the real concern comes if they cannot de-push the lanes fast enough on the side of IG, because I feel like they're going to be forced into that kind of split-push play. Ooh, Courier? Oh, Jarex is going to go for it. Oh, Miss Burrow Strike almost gets it. And is he actually going to be able to TE out of this one? They didn't have Coil. Oh, God. no, that's a baseball moment. Yeah, Boboka missed the Burrow. It's oh, unfortunate. Bobo, no. Yeah, but like you were talking about during the draft, the whole split-push potential of IG, I think that's going to have to come into play here at some point. Because yeah. if they're walking down lanes with like three or four heroes and they're not finding much success, then you need to make sure that the lanes are constantly pushed out because eventually this alchemist is going to be massive and you have to make sure that you can pressure somewhere else on the map instead of having to fight him head on because you don't really have what I would call direct hero counters to him right now. Bobica goes and takes the bounty rune away from S4. Once again, a little bit of deja vu to our very first bounty rune. No Tail has picked himself up a pipe. Uh, was actually thinking about going to Hannah Midas before completing the pipe, but he wants that early team fight item now. It's I super could, value. Yeah, I could kind of feel him against this puck. First damage that's available there. I think it's it's a really nice item progression because the pipe in of itself makes you feel crazy tanky. And the weakest point, I think, for Necrophos, if you're worried about dying, is either getting purged when you have your Ghost Shroud on or just getting bursted by magical damage when you have the Ghost Route on. And this kind of solves pretty much both of those issues. Uh, smoke up here from IG. Look at a head down to bottom lane, see if they can catch No Tail. Uh oh, they may be too late. The orb is going to reveal the last second. The coil! Half a second too late. That would have been such a huge kill, but now OG have managed. They brought No Tail into the mid lane, so they're in a good position to see if they can actually kind of put some pressure on this mid tower with fresh radiance of the Alchemist. Plus that pipe. They're gonna find burning here. 
Jarex is actually going to be ruptured up. Burning does have the stun to be able to stop that one. Tries to get out of the silence, but he's not going to make it far. As um, the pipe actually lost his survive long enough to be able to get off the stun. The Reaper Scythe cuts down the Bloodseeker. That's two down from Invictus Gaming, making a third. They've snatched up the Morphling and pulled him back to his doom. Eight to eight, 16 minutes in, and all of a sudden, OG are in full swing. That's what we call a debate right there, folks. <laughs> that was a very nice follow-up. The, the points into Unstable Concoction coming in huge there. The damage output, just when the Radiance Burn is there, you're fighting into potentially an Acid Spray as well as the Necrophos. Having the early fight, keeping Jerax alive long enough to get that kind of counter-initiation, that is... That's exactly what you want. If you're OG, they're walking straight into Roshan. They know that you know, there's no coil right now. Bloodseeker's dead still for 20. They have the Minus Armor to be able to do this. And he's just dead for so long with that added respawn time. He would be up right now and could TP in and see if he could get a silence off. But the added respawn time gives OG so much extra to work with. All IG can do, well, you can see what XXS is doing. He's trying to push down bottom and see if he can get as much damage on the tier two while OG was rushing. Yeah, we'll get to see that one more time as well. The uh, whole team fight. Look, look at how long that Jerax lasts. He gets the stun off because he has the presence of mind to walk out of the blood rate, knowing that he's going to get stunned by burning. Yeah. He just wants to make sure he can get that one extra spell. And the bonus kill coming in from the lasso, courtesy of S4. That results in the Roshan here for OG. Very impressive early game coming out from them, given how scary OP looked in the very beginning of the game. They'll get another denied tower, Jerex. Dude, look at Anna's network. Here. Oh my lord. Yeah, it's beginning to get out of control. It was like three minutes ago where he was only like 1,500 ahead. Now he's 5,000 almost ahead. He's going to go the full Manta Octarine build to a fresh Naga Siren. And, I mean, again, fortunately, IG do have a lot of wave clear, but they're going to need every little bit they can against uh, this form of Alchemist. My goodness, that is probably one of the like the fastest net worth climbs I've ever seen. S4 jumps in, and just keep, keep from the light, and they waste no time whatsoever bringing him down. They'll use the Reaper Scythe again. Just the added respawn time just gives them a lot of space to take objectives. This is one of those games where I think you just kind of casually throw out the Reaper whenever, because you know that one hero down, IG are going to feel tentative to defend anything. I mean, Anna is still not really even the one pressuring the map. He's kind of just chilling in his own jungle, farming. His team is creating all that space for him. And S4 already having the blink and the drums available means their pickoff potential is now online. This is the stage where IG are, are trying to think, okay, do we go for the split push strat now? Because our, our Puck just bought a Midas too. A couple of minutes ago, XXS picked that up after his own blink deck. And I think that means that they're, they're looking to gear up for more of this kind of slow, methodical game instead of trying to fight. They just can't afford pickoffs, and one of these heroes, Bulbaka, is going to be susceptible to OG's pick. Loses a lot of that blink dagger gold, which they really need. Because uh, if they are, because they can't just let OG take all the objectives, right? They do have to stand and fight at some point, or maybe go for a five-man smoke gank or something like that. And if they want to be able to win that kind of engagement, they need a harder initiation than just the Puck's blink and coil. They need a solid stun. I think that's where the rupture comes in, and eventually, you know, the, the Blink and the Burrow Epicenter coming in from the Sand King. The issue right now is, you know, Bobak is still a, quite a ways away from his own Blink Dagger, about 800. And OP, he doesn't really have a backup plan because he opted not to get Midas. Mm -hmm. So because he doesn't have a Midas and he went for the SNY, I think the itemization kind of forces them into this awkward spot of you kind of want to fight, but OG's team fight just seems to be a little bit better until the Blink Dagger on the Sand King comes out. Jarek's pushed away. TG out. Burning will take Q's place. Pushing out that bottom lane. He is being more on the shotgun. Has to go scepter, but it's mid lane where Bulbaka's going to get caught once again. Oh, God. This is feeling like that Earthshaker game we watched earlier, Draskal. The Reaper Scythe, fortunately, will not kill him. So he won't have that extra long death timer. Uh, top lane, they're also trying to go for XXS here now. That orb is going to be able to follow him. Phase shift doesn't actually get it out. And he just gets off. I don't think you can phase shift Fortune's End. Uh, like, you can do it when it's in the air, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But you, well, once it hits, I think it counts as a root. Yeah, it does. Man, that actually sucks so bad. <laughs> he had to dodge it, and then he would have been just hit by an unstable concoction after the phase shift, so... That's rough. Oh, OG. Seemingly unstoppable here in the first 15, 20 minutes or so on this game one.
Now, Burning in the meantime, he's doing what he can. He's pushing bottom. He's almost got the E-Blade. Only about 1,500 away. That'll be a really big shift in power, I think. They're able to get a quick pick on anyone. Doesn't even matter who it is. Just, you know, turn the fight into a 4v5. Yeah. That's really what you're looking for. Either kill someone so fast the Oracle isn't able to save them in time, or he maybe just kill the Oracle himself in the back lines. Jump to your replicate to safety. But in the meantime, OP, there's a ward there, so he's going to be caught by the unstable concoction. Anna just runs straight at him. He wants some vengeance for all that nasty landing phase, and he gives him the walk away. He doesn't even stay around for the extra right click he gives him. You're going to die to ask Strain Radius. Dude, he knew. Turn my back to you. How's he it feel, the whole time. How's it feel? Now, this is getting out of control very, very quickly. The net worth lead is pretty much the entirety of Anna's net worth. Like, that's where OG have their advantage. 19,000 net worth in a 22 minute game. Complete insanity. Now, uh, click back to Bulbaka. He's the same gold sitting in his bank that he was like five minutes ago. He's been getting focused a lot, though. Like, yeah, he's been he getting really chased around by Jerax. You know, S4 has lassoed him. He's gotten Reapered. Like, yeah, it, it's just like that, that Hellraiser's game where we were talking about Milan's or Shaker and how they were uh, how they were always willing to use the, the Void Chronosphere just to lock down the Earthshaker because keep that Blink Dagger at not much is going to happen. Burning, they attempted to go on him, but Lincoln did protect him long enough for him to jump to his replicate. And that will mean without the Ethereal Blade before the next high ground push. Oh, Jarex ruptured up. Silence is going to walk away from that one, though. His team is there to protect him. He's got those tranquil boots, man. Didn't even break. Oh, nice pickup here. They're going to be able to grab OP, drag him far, far away. His Q pushed him even farther that, away. I was going to say, that blinding light actually <laughs> helped them. All right. Let's see. Seeker's really not making it home. Bonus for stuff. There is an Aghanims up on this Keeper of the Light. I know we haven't really talked about Q so much, but. You know, pushing into the high ground with the Alchemist having this many items normally is very hard to stop, but they, they do have a tremendous amount of wave clear between the Puck and the, the Keeper of the Light with the Blast. Yeah, it seems like there there's no way for them to push high ground in this night time. Next but Roche, maybe. Have to do yeah, next Roche, they could probably do it. But they do have the Pipe and the Sustain of Death Pulse. That might be enough to kind of tip the scales to where OG can, can feasibly kill the Tier 3. And once that happens, you know, you open up the Shrines and the rich get richer as they say. That is Alchemist's motto. Exactly. It's going to pick up an Octarine soon. That means more Manta Illusions out a whole lot sooner. Or Jesus. He might oh, actually even get away. away. Yeah. He's cool. going to blink back down. He has the Shrine up, but the nuke from Fly. Hello. Nice catch there. I think the Purifying Flames range catches a lot of people off guard. Yeah. It is actually huge. It's 15 to 8 with a 10,000 gold lead for OG. But this is an Alchemist lineup, so it can't be deceptive. So we turn towards the experience where you see a real lead, 7,500. OG, even if you say, but Alchemist, mid lane, what's happening there? Jesus. Okay, S4, I'm not sure how he ended up there, but they might be able to kill OP. The Reaper Sight is enough. He's trying to get back, back, back. The Unstable Concoction's coming in. He throws out the Silence, actually goes for the stun onto Sand King to stop the Epicenter. That's quick thinking from Anna, even if it means he misses out on the kill from OP. While the Morphling's Replicate of the Alchemist is being beaten down, but they're actually going to shrine up. No, sorry, Replicate. Not going to be able to save from that one. They push him back a little bit deeper into the base. Underneath that Tier 3 tower, they do use that false promise. So he's going to be staying alive a little bit longer, though, but he doesn't really have a target for his unstable concoction. He's going to stun himself again right outside that Tier 3, and he doesn't even heal that much. He's going to be pushed back even further. They desperately need this kill, and it's going to be worth so much. He's trying to armlet toggle his way out of this one. Fly saving him from all that oh magic damage. Oh, a stun from Jarek's air. He turns, and he managed to kill one. He's going to go for burning up next. Sweet, sweet vengeance for Anna. He goes for more. Burning's going to be able to get back to the base, but they've already killed two of IG. And what seemed the ultimate disaster scenario from OG losing their Alchemist, losing their 23,000 net worth hero would have been a huge windfall for Invictus Gaming, but they're denied that much. Fly God, just Fates Edict, False Promise, another Fates Edict. All the damage that they were trying to do to him, they couldn't burst him because no one can hit spells. He's sitting in the base with no ultimate. Another lasso comes out here. Don't take me away, Hugh. He's gonna be dragged back, Anna. 
Again, focusing on his own replicate. He's just not going to let that opposing illusion survive. And Invictus Gaming are going to be forced to use a buyback on the Keeper of the Light just to make sure that OG can't continue to push high ground during this daytime. I think OG are going to be more than happy. Like, look at this cap. Just how tanky he is. Gets the False Promise after the Burrow. He throws out the Fate Seed. It gets a couple of heals going. And Fly's positioning during this fight was just immaculate. Going back, chasing him out of the base. Jarex in a position to get a counter stun a little bit later on. It was absolute flawless play here from OG. I thought for sure right there, that burrow strike. But there was so much heal coming out from Fly at that period of time. Three-man stun, courtesy yeah. of your Slardar player. That was just, that was a treat to watch. Very, very well played from OG. But at the same time, IG showed that, you know, they have the damage. They can, they can take him down if OG aren't ready. And emboldened by that knowledge, they're going to go for the four-man smoke up, push through mid lane. See if they can find somebody. They're going to run into an invis. Matt Ryder, he jumps away. A little bit scared, just in case they end sentries. You never know. And, uh, that is going to be a smoke failure for Invictus Gaming. But what does OT do with this? They're kind of been waiting for Roshan. They see it's going to be up now. And with the Cross of Haze, they could really make short work of him. It's going to drop extremely fast. I think the the next point where Anna's going to feel maybe almost indestructible for a little while is after, of course, the Lincolns and maybe if he gets another armor item. I think that's really the way that they can burst him. Now that he has the Octarine, he has so much raw health that the E-Blade combination with Bates Edict, it doesn't really seem like it's enough. Yeah. So the right click is where he has to itemize next after this uh, potential Roshan attempt here. Both teams kind of hovering in the area. IG looking for a better position. Yeah, they're going to do the full wrap up into the shrine area. Hope that no one's there. And then once they see no one is there, they this can is ring around the rosy the right now. Yeah, they're, they're going to try to get the opposing high ground, but OG have the same exact idea. They're going to go into the dire shrine. They're going to do the wrap around as well. Are they going to be able to catch him? Where's this fight actually going to end up? Oh, they know. I don't know. They Rather know. They, go. they see it now. Invictus Gaming, they're going to turn. The smoke's going to pop onto Anna. He's the frontline hero. Can they actually blow him up, though? It's going to be super tough. They throw out the silence. They already have a ball promise ready to go on to Anna Protector. So Burning Star's going for the back line. He tries to attack Fly, trying to take him on, but he's actually taking so much damage with Reaper Sight. He has to start backing himself away. They've lost their Sand King already. IG in full retreat will not be losing more than just their support. So fortunately, their cores stay alive, but OG win yet another team fight. The reveal of the Lincolns. OP tried to throw out the rupture straight away, but he couldn't get it because they didn't click on Anna fast enough. You know, when they heated the moment, they saw the smoke reveal and they're like, we need to go. This hero's in the front line. Unfortunately, Fly was in the back. Immediate false promise during the chemical rage. So much regeneration. You just cannot deal enough damage to kill this Alchemist. And now they're going to be able to get Aegis. Jeez. And that's so much work. Especially with a hero like Necrophos. He probably takes... He's probably one of the best heroes with cheats, right? You've got maybe yeah. Storm Spirit, who's really good, obviously, but just the fact that this is a taint, like, like this is a hero that wants to kind of be on the front lines, but ha now has this huge amount of turnaround potential with the cheese, as well as the Reaper Scythe. Haste. This is getting to be crunch time here for IG. What can they do? You know, can they push out the lanes fast enough? We can already see, you know, XXS is in the top lane. Burning's kind of running around with the Z-Blade, seeing if he can find something as well. You can feel the sense of urgency right now that IG has. What? We need to buy time. Why did, why did that happen? That's when did that happen? did that happen? They're like <laughs> sitting right on top of each other inside of the base. Yeah, I just see them flying by each other. I mean, why not? I guess if you have a hero on your team that gets items so fast that he has to use the courier all the time, I mean, there was, want. The, there was that time the courier died. Do you think they bought a courier to replace it for that three minutes? Uh, honestly, I would I would have to watch the replay, Cat. I cannot confirm or deny. 20 to 9, 17,000 gold lead, and OG are going high ground during nighttime, so the Keeper of the Light is not at that full. They do not like this combination, though. They're giving Blood Rage onto Q. I had noticed that. So his blast is doing a little bit more, but OG are so damn tanky, they just don't seem to care. And it's down to half HP, but he's got Aegis. They're going to try and get an aggressive force snap forward underneath the tier fours, but they really have to target someone else in this, and that's why they go for the rupture on the back line. Sheriff's going to be hit by that one, but he just can't get to that hero to threaten anybody. In fact, he's going to be asked for with the initiation. S4 takes an ethereal blade shotgun to the face, but it doesn't matter. He's down to half HP. Jesus Christ! Wow. Or Morphling just got popped! 
OP is going to come in with his BKB, but I don't think it matters at all. This is just a suicide move, and IG will call it. This series, we talked about how important it was for either one of these teams to take the 2-0 against the other to really give themselves some solid, I would say, cushion to be able to land in that top four. And OG, you said they're the ones who have to face LFY. They yep. probably need a little bit more. And, uh, well, they get this first one two-game series. Man, I usually when you second pick an Alchemist and play it as a core, it doesn't really have as much success as we saw Ana have in this game. Yeah. So very, very nice stuff coming in here from OG. Drafting very well around the hero, just ensuring that he got every single thing that he needed. S4 played great, as well as Jarax finding so many picks in conjunction. And Fly with the great positioning during that fight mid, where if he died there, could have been a completely different ballgame. Yeah. No tail. Turning up the heat in the OG room, because they are cool as cucumbers, Drasko. They just demolished IG with an Alchemist strategy. Who said Alchemist was dead? Who said OG Alchemist was dead? Not I. Not I. Not I. Must have been our deceptive viewers. All right, guys, we're going to come back for game number two after a short break.